Woohoo! All right. Welcome, everyone, to the HAI Research Seminar. Uh, my name is Jennifer Hicks. I'm Executive Director of the Wusai Human Performance Alliance at Stanford, and really thrilled to introduce our speaker today, who is Ellen Kuhl. Uh, Ellen is the Walter B. Reinhold Professor in the School of Engineering and Robert Bosch Chair of Mechanical Engineering at Stanford. Uh, her area of expertise is living matter physics, the design of theoretical and computational models to simulate and predict the behavior of living systems. Ellen has published more than 200 peer-reviewed journal articles and edited two books. She's also an active reviewer for more than 50 journals at the interface of engineering and medicine, as well as an editorial board member of seven international journals in her field. Um, Ellen is also a member of our executive committee for the Wusai Human Performance Alliance and part of our digital athlete uh, moonshot research program. Uh, in today's seminar, Ellen will discuss how the gold standard in biomedical modeling has long been to select a model and then fit its parameters to data. Uh, but the scientific criteria for model selection remain poorly understood and the success of the approach really depends largely on user experience and personal preference. Uh, she proposes a new constitutive model that outperforms traditional approaches, one that could fundamentally change how we simulate biomedical systems. Uh, so really excited to hear the talk, but before we begin, a few logistics details. Uh, so we have folks here uh, in person and also on Zoom. Uh, we'll take questions at the end. For in-person folks, we'll pass around a mic. Uh, for the Zoom audience, you can use Zoom chat to message the group, but make sure you ask your questions through Slido. Um, you can click on the link that will be posted in the chat shortly. I'll be choosing questions from Slido after the presentation, and Slido has a nice upvote feature uh, so that I can choose questions that you all are most interested in. Uh, for the live audience, there's also some QR codes around the room if you want to go into Slido and upload questions as well. And again, you can also raise your hand and, and ask a question that you'd like as well. And then we'll split the Q&A time between, between questions from the virtual audience and questions from the live audience. Uh, so with that, let's begin. I'll pass it over to Ellen. Really excited for your talk. Thanks, Ben. All right, this is great to get introduced to everybody here before the talk, so it's kind of neat to know what you're doing. Um, what I would like to do is I would like to share our work on um, automating as Jen said, the process of discovering a good model. And with model, I actually mean a model, a mechanics model that maps deformation into stress. So it's a little bit of a narrow definition of model, but I'll show you in a bit how that applies. This is uh, work jointly with I need to do something. Lost the. So this is joint work um, with Skylas and Pierre in our lab. And then uh, also, um, uh, Kevin Linker, who is a postdoc in, um, in Germany. Matthias Pilling is a postdoc in the Netherlands. Adrian Buganza, who is uh, an assistant professor at Purdue, was associate professor at Purdue, was with our uh, lab for a while. Um, and then uh, also international collaboration. And so what I'm focusing on is I'm focusing on different types of discovery for different types of organs. And I'll also show you how we can um, apply that then to simulations directly. And that's all going to be part of the human body. So it's interesting for um, human performance in the sense that we want to understand parts of the body. So that includes, uh, for instance, the heart, that includes the brain, um, that includes skin. And we want to create models from that. Um,
Yeah. All right, now you can see. Okay, so before I start, I want to do a shameless promotion of something that might be of interest to many of you. Um, so as Jen mentioned, uh, we all part, many of us part of uh, the Human Performance Alliance. And this is a great uh, group of people and a great institute at Stanford and beyond. Actually, it's a nationwide initiative. And the idea is to study athletes and understand human health. And if you are um, studying health in general, this is typically done the other way around. People look at very, very sick people and they try to understand how they can help them. And here we flip the approach. We look at very healthy, extremely highly performance um, athletes and try to understand and learn from them uh, about diseases. So this is not only about aesthetics, but it's really understanding disease through a high performance. Um, right now, there's two programs where you can all engage. Uh, it's a doctoral and a postdoc program. If you have students or you are a student that applies to these uh, criteria here, you're welcome to uh, attend. There is uh, an information session next Wednesday. And Hannah and Jen are here. So Hannah is just waving at you. So if you have questions, reach out to Hannah or to myself, and we can help you out to get started on this. The applications are due early next year, and then you would start next summer. And you become part of a group of people, so you can see many of them here, and you also see some of them in the back if you have questions about this. So this is just advertising part of the, the, our background here. And now I want to come to uh, more locally what we do in our group. So we model um, and study living systems, and you can see many of them here, and you can see immediately how they relate to human performance. So there's the heart. There's bones, there's a brain, there's muscle, uh, there's a lung. And what's key to modeling these systems is understanding their mechanical behavior. And so when we study this, um, you want to understand all these types of behaviors of all kinds of organs in the body. And most importantly for us is the stiffness or the behavior, how deformations translate into stress. So if you think about performance, Someone gets a hit to the head, we know the acceleration of that head impact. We want to translate that into a force and from that force, calculate the stress distribution across the entire brain, identify certain regions that are hit hard, and then correlate them to function, probably a region of speech, a region of motor skills or something like that. So for that, we are right here on the very left of the scale. And the scale is a log scale of stiffness. And you can imagine the brain is the softest of all organs, so it's the most challenging to test. So I'll share those results with you. And once you can do it for the brain, these things become actually quite easier because they're easier to test and understand. So we did this with uh, a PhD student, Sylvie, and she tested human brain. And you can see here that the samples, you can already see how soft it is. When you cut little cubes, it almost immediately deforms under its own weight. And the study here was about studying the differences between different regions in the brain. And you can easily see there is gray and white matter. So there's the inner part of the brain and then this outer folded part around it. And so Sylvie took uh, these brains, cut little cubes and tested them in tension, compression and shear. Now um, you can see the heterogeneity here. So there's a huge variation across brains. We were lucky to get our hands on 10 brains and slice them. And you can already see from the pictures that they are fairly different. So we are expecting big variations. We tested in four regions that are indicated there in color, and we tested tension, compression, and shear, and in multiple cycles. And then already from this picture, you can see this is anything but linear, right? So it is actually very challenging to find a model. So the idea is, can we understand this relation between how much we deform it and how much stress is to us internally? So these are four different regions that we tested. And then every row here corresponds to one of the three different tests. So the top is tension, the middle is compression, and underneath you can see shear. And the first thing to note from a, from a material science point of view is that the first and second row have different values. So it's not symmetric in tension and compression. It makes it very challenging to model. You can also see there's large variations. We already talked about that. And it's anything but linear. So now the question is, can we find a model, meaning an equation that represents all these behaviors in one equation? Right. Um, and if you go to the literature, what people would usually do, and I think Jen already described it quite nicely, they would just go ahead and scan the literature for models. And typically, there are no brain models. So they would just go and look what's similar to brain, maybe rubber. So they would find this if they go into like some material model literature. 
And you wouldn't probably know what's the best of this and neither would I. So the question is, what do people do? They just pick one. And typically in this case, many people would go with the second for whatever reason. reason. So they would pick the mooney rivlin model. And these are models that have all different type of form. And what you see in red is the parameters. So they also have different parameters to fit. And what we try to do is eliminate this process altogether. This has been the gold standard for years and years and decades. And we want to take this out of the picture entirely, and we want to have a neural network that can do this entirely for us. Even worse, if you want to model this with finite elements, and this is just one of the many finite element programs, it's the most used nonlinear finite element program, it's called Abacus. You go to their manual and you see exactly the same models that I've just shown you show up in their manual. And this is just for the sub, sub, sub menu of one of them. So you can imagine how many there are. There's dozens of these models. And the user has to find one to get started with the simulation. It's a huge bottleneck, and it requires a long training and well-trained experts to do this right. We want to take this out of the equation. So if our 18-year-old son were to do this, he would just look at the neural network. And he would just say, what's your problem? You just put something in, run it through the network, get something out, works well. And actually works well almost always, because as we all know, neural networks can approximate any kind of function. The problem with this approach is that the network doesn't know much about the physics. So we'll give you a function, but the function would not reflect any physics, and we can't really learn from the function. It's just a function that fits the data quite well. Typically, when people do neural networks, they use these kind of what's called activation functions. And you can see they all look very different from the stresses I have shown you. So some have a jump, some have a kink, uh, some go have horizontal tangents. And that's all things that we didn't see in the stress. So these don't seem to be very useful functions for us. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reverse engineer functions that are more useful and the network, arch network architecture that's also more helpful. And here's why. So if you look at this, um, you will probably identify this function that you can see, and that's a tangent hyperbolic function. After the last data point, the curve just flattens out. And that's simply because that's what the tangent hyperbolic function does. So it just flattens. and so after your last point that you train on, you would just predict something entirely random. Also, these parameters are non-interpretable. And most importantly, and you can see this here, they violate physics. So there's oscillations in this case. You can see there's only very few data points. If you try to fit a complex network, so you're overfitting, and then you have a behavior that's not physical. And here you can see it very well, but not always does it display so well. And sometimes it's hidden and you just see it in the full big drone simulation. And especially when you work with clinical simulations or biosimulations, this can be quite critical to the patient. So the idea is, can we do better? And what we do is we want to hardwire all the physics knowledge that have that material science people, physicists, um, mechanics people have acquired over the last 50 years or so, and build this into this network, hardwired in right from the get-go. And the idea is, at the beginning, we can constrain the input to the network. And there's a couple of technical terms here that tell you how you can constrain it. And at the end, we also want to constrain the output of the network. And there's also a couple of technical terms. And then in the middle, you can see not everything is connected here. And that's also important to ensure that the function that we learn is fully convex and doesn't have these oscillations. So there's a couple of things that we hardwire into the structure. And then we get a physics-informed neural network. I'm not saying we're the first people to do this. This has come up over the last year and a half or so. So these are papers that have just come out in the last 12, 18 months. Um, and it's a huge, huge push with the idea of discovering science from data and really discovering science, not just discovering curve fit, but really can we learn anything from the network. And so there's a, a, a vast body of literature. Um, people do it slightly different from us, and I can show you where it differs. Um, but I'm just saying this is the field in material science at this point, actually. So this is a kind of networks more specifically uh, that we have used. So this is called the deformation gradient. So this encodes, encodes for the deformation that we imply to our little sample. Uh, we extract invariant. We build the identity or the square. And then we just build the identity exponential or logarithmic function to add this all up and then calculate the stress. So you have 12 color-coded nodes in your second and last hidden layer. So you have a combination of 12 terms. And combinatorics gives you 2 to the power of 12 different models. 
So you can combine any of these colored nodes with any other because the functions are all different. You span a functional space of two to the power of 12. So that's 4,000. And that's just for illustration. You can do it with more and more if you find good functions. But now we're screening with one run for 4,000 different models. We also reverse engineer the activation functions. You can see this here. This is the functions of our last layer. So they can be linear, exponential, or logarithmic. And these look much more that like the stresses I've shown you before. So they actually smooth, they go through zero, they're monotonic, they don't converge to a horizontal tangent. So do all the nice things that we actually see in the stress uh, measurement. So now um, talking about data, we're sharing all the data, we've, we've cleaned it up. And if you work with data, you know the much of the work goes into cleaning it up. So we cleaned it up for you. So if you don't have your own, you can go to our GitHub channel and try it, download it, and run it. If you have your own data, you could just clean it up to make similar and then just run it over that. So this is how it always looks. This is all the data that we extracted from these experiments. You can see there's four regions, there are three tests, and there's uh, the means of about 30, 20 to 30 tests on each of these columns. So now if we fit this, um, we have the training on tension, the training on compression, and the training on shear. And then there's a prediction on tension, compression, and shear. So on the diagonal, we actually train. And then on the off diagonal, we predict the behavior of the other tests with what we've trained. And this is something a regular neural network couldn't do. So for example, what this is, is predicting the behavior in shear when you train the network with just the tension test. As you can see, you actually come quite close without even ever having done a shear test. Um, this last column is doing all three together. So we train on all three. And obviously then we get the best fit uh, all together. And we can then also reduce the number of terms. So that's what we call the discovered model. So in our language, our understanding is when we train on all three tests, we gain a model. In this case, only has four terms instead of all 12. And that's one of these 4,000 models. In this case, they're all blue. And that's new because if you work on the brain, as you look at all the literature, people usually, usually use these terms to do it in the first invariant. So there's more use of red terms. Nobody actually ever uses blue, but it turns out that these terms are better. So from a modeling perspective, you actually learn something about what's the better selection. here. This is for all four regions. And you can see all terms are in this blue category, which is kind of like a nice understanding interpretation from a material science perspective. Um, you can then also recover all of these models that I've introduced you earlier um, by just going a certain path through the network. So for example, take the green model. The green model comes here and it goes this path. And that's what's called the Blatsko model. And it uses just this term. It can force all other weights to zero and can use the same structure to just use this model and identify its parameters. So we can do this for special, special cases that are just included in the set of uh, 4,000. And if we do this, you can see the fit of the models that people generally use. So there are four of these popular models using only one term. You can see they don't fit uh, the curves as nicely as what I've shown you as the automatic discovery. And you can see and quantify this even better if you look at the goodness of fit. So this is looking at the R squared values. So this is how far away we are from the data. And the colors are these special models that people have used in literature. And the gray is our model. We want this to be close to one. As you can see on the diagonal, they're almost all close to one because they fit the data. On the off diagonal where we test, you can see that our model performs better. So it performs better than all existing models. So we've discovered in a way if you want the best model. And not only that, if you look at the individual columns, you can also find the best test for the model to train itself. So if you look at the column that has the highest R values, that would be this one. So you can see if you only can do one single experiment, you want to do a tension test because that gives you the most information. So that's quite neat. I'm just showing you where we use this just to give you a flavor where we use stress analysis in the brain. So like I already mentioned, the hit to the head is a classical example. There's also examples in surgery where the surgeon cuts open the skull and the brain swells out. So if you have a, a hematoma or swelling in the brain, you need to give it some space. And we simulate those processes with surgeons. We also simulate brain growth and folding of the brain when a child, when the brain is developing. And then there's also simulations here of Alzheimer's, how the brain is shrinking and the stress is focused on that. 
So there's a lot of applications where stresses are critical in understanding the brain. Um, the next thing that people said, okay, well, listen, well, it works for the brain. And she just said at the beginning, it translates and wants to understand the brain. Um, it's not entirely true. So some tissues are not like the brain. So if you look at your skin, for example, you see lines. And those lines make it anisotropic. So they make it behave differently along the, the wrinkles and orthogonal to the wrinkles. And so this is because this is collagen fibers and the collagen fibers stiffen the skin in that direction. You can see the anisotropy if you look at your skin. And we do this by having two extra terms here. You realize there's two more. So we make a broader um, range of terms. And now we can discover models from two to the power of 16 from 60,000 models. And we do this for skin data. And this is the skin data. You can again download and look at it. Uh, you can see skin is not tested in tension compression shear. It's like this thin layer. And typically, you want to test it in uh, biaxial tension. So it, you hook a little um, sheet of skin onto the device, and then you can test it in two directions independently. And then you can recover classical models that people have used. And I want to draw your attention to this model. This is the most widely used model in biomechanics. It has one term that's dark red. And that's a linear term that's supposed to describe the matrix of the skin. And then this term describes the behavior of the collagen fibers. So it's a two-term model. So let's see how it performs. You can see the data here, but the model doesn't perform quite that well. Um, it doesn't fit in either of the two directions that skin was tested. These are the two terms, and you can see it's actually way off. And it's surprising that so many people are using it, probably because they never really look exactly in the fit that they do. So we use our network without knowing this and just run it again. And you can see it's a great fit. If you compare the two models, the second term, this turkey's term is exactly the same. And that captures the exponential behavior, but also the other red term captures exponential behavior of the matrix. So this is actually telling you that the matrix of the skin is not linear, but also exponential. So there's actually something to be learned about this. Now you can say this works for pig, this also works for rabbit. So we looked at rabbit data as well. So di discovering exactly the same model, the exact two, two terms out of 60,000 terms are the best terms to describe this. And that's actually quite surprising. So we were actually quite happy with that result. So um, again, we can compare the goodness of it. This is the model that people use. This is our model. You can see it comes very close to one. And the only column where it doesn't is where we train in a direction that we haven't tested. So we use skin models to um, describe, for instance, one here is a collaboration with L'Oreal. Uh, they're interested in the folding of skin or wrinkling. And the wrinkling is a clear um, function of the different stiffnesses of the outer layer of the skin and the skin underneath. And if the outer layer gets too stiff, you have a different type of folding pattern than, uh, than when it's very soft. So that's why they want to put lotion on it. Um, this is also simulation of skin. This is with a pediatric uh, and reconstructive surgeon. This is not the disease here. This is the treatment. So this is a young kid that is born with this um, black, what's called a nevus. You have to remove that because it can become cancerous. And so in order to remove this big part of the skin, they have to regrow skin on the kid's face and then pull it over create a flap for reconstruction. And so the simulation can tell you where to grow the flap and how fast to expand this. It sits in over a period of a couple of weeks and then always fills it more and more. And then at some point you can pull it over. And you can see at the end, um, you can pretty much no longer see any of this. You want to do this when the child is very young. So you can have a lot of mechanics. They're interested in, in like guiding this process throughout the way. So now I've shown this for brain, I've shown this for skin. Um, and I want to advertise a class. I think open uh, enrollment opens today or tomorrow. So for those of you who are interested, um, there's a class that we're teaching on exactly what I'm telling you today. It's called Automated Model Discovery. It's really happening in the, the winter quarter. And the class in parallel where you can test tissues or we can send your students to test tissues. So we have these two devices that I've just uh, talked about. So this is for uniactor and uh, tension compression testing. And this is for biaxial testing. And I give you an example of a student project from last year where students tested tissue. And this was a cool application that I'm actually most excited about because this was testing something we had no knowledge about. 
Um, this is Skylar and Sylvia and Ethan, and they decided last year in this class to taste artificial meat. And as you can imagine, this is something that's super, super important because the, the market of artificial meat is incredibly exponentially increasing. And that's just for environmental reasons and many other reasons. So of course, it's important for public health, animal welfare, food security, and for the environment. The market itself is hugely exploding. And the interest here is to understand the mechanical signature of artificial meat, because the mechanics of meat is um, supposed to be correlated to the perception of taste. So if you ever eat like very soft tofu, you probably wouldn't relate it to meat products. But there's a lot of artificial meat products now that have the stiffness of real meat. So these three students have their tofurkey, which is a, a tofu-like um, turkey, a chicken, artificial chicken, and real chicken, and compared their results. And since nobody has ever done this, they have discovered the very first model for artificial meat. So here's the data, and here's the model. So this is tension compression shear again, and then they discover a model. Now, one thing that sometimes happens, and that you can see here, it looks kind of cool because it's so nice and colorful, but this model covers the entire spectrum of terms. And that's really not too handy. So it would be a model that has to count probably out of these 16 terms or 14 terms, it has 12 activated. So that you can't really call this a very useful model. So one thing that uh, works well to reduce the number of terms is there's a, an L2 regularization that you can add to the loss function. And that's the equation up there. And with this parameter alpha, you can do like a two to play with the number of terms. So if you ramp up this regularization term, you slightly have a slightly worse fit, but then you can go as far as to only have two remaining terms, and that would be these two in there. So depending on how many terms you want to discover, you can also play a little bit with how accurate. So this is uh, comparing to existing models. So you can also use this again to fit and find models that exist and fit them to, in this case, to Perky, <laughs> and uh, actually learn about the stiffness of the materials. Um, okay, so there was a, a cool application that came out of a class. And now I want to just at the very end say, okay, we, we were at this point where we said, can we discover this automatically? And uh, we have a good partnership with um, the Salt System and Abacus. And so I told them about uh, nine months ago that we're doing this. And I said, hey, are you guys interested in implementing this into your code? So at first they were very skeptical because of course this is their huge, huge asset, right? I mean, in the eighties and the nineties, all these companies developed all these different models and they would always outperform one another because now they have 69 and now they have 58 or 81. So everybody wants to have more than someone else. And of course, they're like, no, we don't want to reduce this to just one. This would be just giving up all our assets. And then after like thinking about it for a few weeks, they came back and said, hey, we really want to work on this with you. We want to have one, one subroutine, one function that captures all of this. So this is part of what they're doing. And this is the code. And the code is really just two slides. So instead of all these 90 functions, they have reduced it to two subroutines or four subroutines since the first one. And this is exactly does what the network does. So the first one is finding um, this energy and taking um, as a, a function of all this input. This one here takes the derivative. So this is the energy, this is the stress, and this is the slope. So this first derivative of the energy is the stress, and this is the slope that they need for their calculations. And then the next two just calculate the first layer. So this. So it just builds the identity and the square. And the second one just does this, the identical exponent and logarithm. You can see that right here. This is like the identical exponent and logarithm is their derivative. And that's all there is. So now all their constitutive models and way more, we've seen 40,000 or 4,000 in this case, fall into this scheme of uh, four subroutines on two pages. Now, this is the input to it rather than having this complex, complex, um, page and then handbook, you just need this one top line with these lines of code. Essentially what you need is the parameters that come out of the network. So the network spits out when you train it, these weights, like a normal neural network, and these weights translate into the material parameters. And they have a physical unit of stiffness, so you can find 
the shear stiffness here, you can find cross house ratios, so real physical units, if you look at these. And they come out of the network and they enter the in input file, so there's only this one line. This last is a crosstalk between what the network learns and what Abacus or the finite element program reads in for any function. So how do these functions look like? They translate all into one similar, one universal uh, subroutine with this input. So it's all the same function. Um, just see the thing that's different is a one line input. And then does it work? So this was the simulation I've shown you earlier, and this is the simulation with this universal subroutine. This works for existing models. It also works for new models. So these were the models we had together discovered just now for the brain. And this is how it looks in Abacus. And this is for white matter, slightly different behavior. And this is also now in Abacus with just this handshake of the subroutine. Now this allows anyone, we hope, um, to use this. Nobody needs to read this. And actually all the people we work with work a lot with clinical scientists who are not experts in finite element analysis, material modeling, and input files can now use this, uh, this technology in, if you want. So it's kind of like making it available to a lot of people. And this is a simulation of the brain. So this is looking at impact to the brain uh, in different re um, regions, so from the top, from the side, and from the front. And this is the stress pattern that you achieve. And you can see there's clear um, peaks of stresses at the interface of the gray and white matter where we had tested for different material models. Okay. Um, the very last example and most current is to do this also for arteries. So here's the data on arteries. Arteries also have two different layers, which you can see in the test. So there's uh, just this cruciform test where we have peeled off or the collaborators have peeled off the top of it. So this is work being done in Graz in the lab of Gerhard Holzapfel, and they have tested this. And then if you take the data and run it over the, uh, through the network, you define find this model for the media, that's the inner layer of the artery. You can put this in Abacus, get the same plot. This is the outer layer of the artery, finds exactly the same model with a different parameterization out of all these possible models. And that's this, uh, the subroutine. And then here's the model. So then you can just feed it in through this couple of lines of code. And this is um, the aortic arch. And you can see that the two layers here are discretized separately, put together. And then you can look at cross sections of this aortic arch at a different stress level. So this is a, a blood pressure of diastole. And this is a blood pressure during systole when the heart is pumping. And what's interesting is you can see the stress differences between the inner and outer layer. And that's actually important because typically in biological structures, when you have a stress concentration, like here at the boundary, or a jump, that's where something happens. So you, in this case, you will see dissection of the aorta at this interface of two different layers, and that's where it might unpeel. And this is um, the model that people use in literature, very standard model. So just pretty much exactly the same thing for comparison. Okay, so to summarize, I've been trying to convince you uh, that we can replace this whole process that people have learned and studied over years and years and years of model selection um, into an automated process uh, where instead of selecting a model and fitting it, we do this all together. So the network um, selects, fits, and um, finds the best model fit uh, in one single step automatically without human interaction. Um, it integrates all the physics, so we don't need to worry about that. If you take an off-the-shelf network, neural network out of just the internet, it won't satisfy all the physics. So we have meaningful model here with interpretable parameters that builds in the physics right away. Um, it builds actually the model out of functional building blocks where we can recover existing functions. So it builds the confidence that it can do what we already know and then some. And then it automatically discovers actually the best model, the best parameters, and also the best experiment to train itself. Uh, what's important is the weights that we learn translate into real physics parameters with physical units and a physical understanding. And then we can embed all this into a universal material subroutine. So you only need one subroutine to interface with the finite element simulation program. We believe that this makes it a lot more accessible for a lot more people from different disciplines or different training backgrounds. Um, these are the people who've worked on it. Um, most of this is on GitHub. So if you're interested in uh, playing with this, you can find it here. And if you need help uh, getting started, please reach out. We're happy to get you set up and start this. 
um, I'd like to advertise the class and then I'd like to end on putting this up again um, to end if people have questions to reach out to either Hannah or Jen after the talk. Thank you. Ellen, that was awesome, super clear, and really exciting work. Um, now we'll go ahead and take questions. First, we have one from the audience, then Madeline will um, bring the mic over. Ellen, I, I like this work. It was a good talk. Uh, I'm really happy to hear the details of this. Um, I was hoping, though, that you would have acknowledged that there has been research on equation discovery for over 40 years, and in fact, that there's two big paradigms for doing this. The neural net paradigm is fairly recent. It started in 1997. Uh, the older work and work is still ongoing doesn't search a space of parameters, but rather searches a space of discrete equation structure. And with, there's usually some parameter fitting after that. But but there are really two two ways of doing this. Could you just say why you chose to search a parameter space using neural nets rather than this uh, sort of classic method of, of searching a space of discrete structure? Um, yeah, sure. So we have, I mean, you're absolutely right. We're not the first to discover a model. We're using constitutive models. So we're looking at uh, material models for living structures and models that map stress into or deformation into stress. So we're not looking at models, for instance, that um, discover partial differential equations or ordinary differential equations. That would be a whole different approach, and that would probably not even fit in this network. We use the network because for our purposes here, it was nice uh, to hardwire everything into the network. There might be other approaches for other ways of discovery, and there might also be other approaches for discovery of constitutive equations. So people use symbolic regression, sparse regression, and other methods to do it. We use this because we can then build on the entire infrastructure that neural networks provide for us. We can combine it with a Bayesian approach, and we can have error analysis and all that built in. So yeah, other people have done this and we can compare what we have found to what other people have found. Yeah. I'm gonna use my moderator prerogative and ask a question also. Um, I'm really, it's really exciting that the models produce uh, are somewhat interpretable. And I was wondering if you've used this approach to compare the parameters or equations that are used for different tissues say disease and non-disease tissue or that artificial meat and real meat that could drive new discovery as far as disease or, or in uh, food science, I guess. <laughs> yeah, great point. So I think the idea of meat, so that was the student project continuing the work with the idea of really saying, okay, can we guide the artificial meat design or creation to make it as realistic and as close to real meat as possible? Um, and in terms, for instance, of the arteries, that's only part. I only showed you the healthy part. There's also a whole section of disease data. And so then the idea is if you get one data set, can you then delineate whether it fits in healthy or disease? Can you use this for diagnostics, for example? Um, and for that, we actually embed this or are currently embedding this in a Bayesian approach where we can actually have a distribution of properties. You've seen there's a huge variation of properties. The meat is pretty reproducible, but the brain data was having huge variation. So ideally you want to have like two curves, a healthy and a disease and see where they overlap so that you can delineate and use this also for diagnostics. Great point, yeah. Very cool. Okay, now we'll go and do a question from Zoom. This is from Morgan Huff. Uh, have you been working with MR elastography data or any other non-invasive techniques to help confirm the brain modeling work? Um, this individual is interested in electrical impedance, ideally. Yeah, great point. And I'm looking at the expert here <laughs> who is scanning pigs here in Lucas. So we have done that as well. So we can do, uh, we have done elect uh, elastography for pig brain stiffness. Um, and I think there's experiments currently ongoing. You want to say something about that, maybe? Uh, yeah, actually, we're. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, we are trying to do to image like we have a big model, large animal model, and we're trying to correlate mechanical like uh, parameters with that. So uh, yeah, in our hands, elastography hasn't worked too well. Uh, so we are not pushing that forward too much. Yeah. Everybody know how that works? 
So you put a person in this case, because it's a scientific study, a pig in the brain in the scan, in magnetic resonance imaging scanner, and you accelerate the head of the brain with like large, uh, with like small vibrations. And these vibrations cause waves and you measure the wave propagation in the brain. And from that, you can back out the stiffness. And I think the question relates to that. So those stiffnesses are great because they're in vivo. Um, the stiffnesses I've shown are actually from cut slices and you can't make them personal to a living person, obviously. So these are ways to actually study the brain over time and disease or during development um, and see how the stiffness changes. We've done a little bit of that, uh, but also only in animal brain. Another question from our in-person audience. Uh, thank you for uh, presenting, and uh, glad that you um, brought up the uh, model of the uh, cultured meats, since we could see this is uh, our applications that really demand both scale consistency. So, for example, replacing these uh, constant animal feeding operations or factory farms for a fast food, that could be one application. So, speaking of that, not just for meat, but a wide range of industries where it could be applied, that if you can have a fairly robust model and then you may be able to reverse engineer according to that how ready uh, do you feel it is for um, actual um, mass scale and i bring this up since i'm actually working with a team uh, focusing on uh, rolling out um, algal photobioreactors that turn co2 into algal biomass which then you can process into uh, cultured meat as well as animal feed and all these uh, products at scale so how far away uh, would you say it is to uh, last year deployment, whether uh, life sciences, whether uh, industrial applications, uh, uh, sustainable foods, you name it? I think it's a great question. And I think it's one of the most exciting applications. It goes pretty much almost in the direction of generative uh, modeling, where you actually generate new models or generate new materials from the input of the different um, ingredients, I guess, in this case. Um, so ideally, if we can use the network to predict correlations between ingredients and properties and then generate the best material and build it actually, or cook it or make it, produce it, I think that would be a great application. I think it's an awesome actually area. Yeah. And probably an application area we need to explore. Yeah. Interesting. All right, we'll do a Zoom and then we'll do an, an in-person question. So from Shyamal Chandra, have you thought about using a network architecture search or topology network search for the model fitting? Um, we have used this so far and it works quite well for the problems we have in mind. This is only, I should also say, only elastic models. So we are currently doing more complex models where we look at failure, fracture, and those have actually usually a time history. So you'd have to loop over the network. So then the structure and the analysis becomes a lot more complicated. it would be recurrent neural networks or actually probably these kind of technologies where we manipulate how we run through the network. Right now, we just have a feed forward network where you feed information, you get something out. But if you look at like um, how something damages over time, you would probably have to run through it multiple times or other use other uh, architectures for the network or other solutions. Yeah, this worked well, but expanding this beyond is actually a great application area. And then question from the audience here. Um, I'm curious. So we know like for a lot of neural networks, the performance is highly dependent on the data that it's trained on and like how well it works for different types of people. I'm wondering if it's applicable here, um, like for example, for the for this uh, skin, like does it matter if the model's trained on people who live in like sunnier areas or, you know, et cetera? It's a great point. So we... I think the so what we thought was cool is it found the same model, meaning the same terms for in this case pig and rabbit. So it's probably also finding the same for other species or for someone who's more in the sun or older or younger. And then the, the only differentiator is the, the parameters, so the weights in the end. But it would go through the same path in the network, ideally, if you have a robust model. It can be that it's not robust, and that would probably tell you something about skin. So for example, if your collagen breaks down when you're older skin becomes um, more floppy and more elastic and less um, integrated, then probably that term will drop out or go down. So I think you can probably discover those things out of the network, ideally, right? And then correlate them back to function. 
All right, we'll do another one from Zoom. Um, how do you select a subset of model terms and promote other terms to go to zero while maintaining differentiability of the loss and re reproducibility of the training that you showed? It's like a real technical question. <laughs> so in these cases, in some cases, it works automatically for the skin and discover two terms, hands down, no, no touching. Um, we have, and then for the meat, I've shown that we can tune it with a loss function where we have a parameter we have a, an LP regularization with a parameter, penalty parameter that can help us tune down the number of terms. Um, I think the question is, is it unique? And that probably underlies the question, is the solution unique? And it probably isn't because we have 16 terms that all have linear quadratic exponential and different uh, input. Um, we looked at just networks with a few terms and that was, uh, that was convex and unique. But the more terms you add, I think the 16 terms is very clear it's not. But it's depending for one on the initialization of the weights when you run with different initialization, especially if you run a stochastic algorithm, it might not always find the same solution. So what we try to do is run it often, often, often. And then what we found is if you regularize, you go, it tends to go into the same minimum and the same parameters, the same path. So that seems to help. And a lot of data also. Another, oh, Parker, did you, were you going to raise your hand? Go ahead. Got a question in the audience there. Thanks for your talk. The, the vision of scientific discovery from data is really inspiring. I'm wondering if you could reflect a little bit more on the scientific implications of the models that you learn from your system. Um, yeah, so we try to find, look at different systems and every system has something that we, we ourselves learned from it. So for instance, for the brain, we learned that there's um, a, a dependence on the second invariance that's more important than the first. It probably doesn't help people here in the room a lot. For skin, we learned that the matrix material is not linear, but exponential. Um, from some of these studies, like what else did we study from, I mean, from the meat, we learned something um, about the terms, how they relate to certain parts of meat function. Um, we've done it for muscle and looked at the viscous behavior. So that was also something to learn. I, I think it depends on the type of tissue and the things that you want to learn. I think the best way is to talk to experts and say, okay, what is it that, like, what did it look like so far? What can be new? What, what is unsure? What is uncertain? What can we discover? But I mean, surprisingly, at least for me, I have always seen something that I didn't expect and very robust. And so I think there are things to discover in this that completely unexpected. And that's because you're screening this huge space. You all of a sudden have access to 60,000 functions where previously you could just do three or 10 by home. And that gives you just enormous insight. And if everything is kind of focused in a certain area of your 60,000 functions, and you just have 10 that are in a certain space, that probably already tells you something pretty valuable. Thank you, Jen. So following up on the question, <laughs> there is, I guess for a, any of these experiments, the question of uh, the actual sample size, most of the organs are, or tissues are hierarchical. So depending on which size you probe them, then you, you might get quite different properties. So I'm wondering if this is something that could be the model can give us some information about these different scales. And also you brought up in your talk the uh, question of anisotropy, anisotropic properties, and that you, that you had to integrate them in the skin, but maybe not in other tissues such as the brain, where there is also a question, because we also have these like fibers, uh, neuronal fibers running through. Yeah, this is a great question. I'm just trying to go back to this because it was somewhat hidden. So this is, for instance, a weight that we learn and I didn't talk about it. And this is the weight that describes the fiber orientation. So you can learn microstructure from this network. So in this case, in terms of microstructure, we learned the collagen fiber orientation that goes into these two. So we learned that as a weight here. So you can build in things and actually you can build in, for instance, cell densities of certain cell populations and relate them to a certain property. So in this case, these are things that probably enter your network somewhere here. You have certain weights of information that you extract here on this level. And then uh, you can learn that as well. So for instance, this gives us actually really the fiber orientation of the collagen fibers. 
automatically out of the network without having to look at it uh, under a microscope. It will probably also give you some concentration of cell types or different composition. Um, yeah, you could learn microstructure. And some people have done that actually quite, uh, quite usefully over the last two years, yeah. Can you say a little bit more about how for, say, the, maybe the brain problem, you selected the um, equations that make up the network. Mm -hmm. And I, if I recall correctly, there were sort of the existing models that used a lot of the reds and browns and didn't use any of the blues. Mm -hmm. So where did the blue equations come from? And then those were the ones that ended up getting yeah. selected in the model. Can you give a little more context? Yeah, so just that? the way this works is all the big data tables that I've shown enter the network here. And then you run through it. And initially, all of this is active. And in the process of minimizing the loss function, so the error between these points and the curves that we fit, in that process, some of them will be dropping out naturally. And in our case, these all dropped out. And so we kept just the ones that in the end described the model. And these happen to be the ones at the very bottom. If you want to force it in a certain path, if you want to just do the red and say, OK, what if it were the red? Then you just set this automatically all to zero and overwrite it pretty much to zero and just leave this one path open with this red term. And then you can find a weight here that is exactly this parameter of this model. And how did the, but where did the, since the blue equations aren't from existing constitutive models, how did you select them as possibilities? Yeah, so the network actually selects it autonomously. So we don't need to do that. So if you run this through, it will find the best fit to the curve. Mm -hmm. so if you look here, um, it finds the best, the closest fit between the points and the curves for the blue terms. So it actually screens and it iterates about, and probably that was your question, it iterates about a thousand times or so through the network uh, and runs about a thousand epochs. And then in that process, and that was actually also related to one of the previous questions, you down select from these 12, it automatically down selects to these terms. And this is probably from my lack of knowledge of constitutive modeling, but like, what is the difference between those blue and other colors? And like, why aren't they not in? Yes, yeah, so they just, they're different functions. And so for instance, this is a linear function. You can see this is not a linear behavior, so it doesn't pop up. Yeah. It's a kind of an exponential behavior. And this is just exponential where this is say, for instance, exponential with the quadratic term here. Okay. So that seems to favor this term. Yeah. Okay. But there's not a big deep meaning that you've entered. No, you can, but you can compare it backwards to existing models and say people relate this to collagen fiber expression or something. Okay, thanks. Another question from our audience here. It's actually a suggestion. I, I really think that it, it, you may, in the future, you may want to emphasize how small your training sets are. Uh, this is so atypical for neural nets, right? And it's because you used the network structure to define a space of possible models. And again, this is you're using neural, neural network technology, but you're not adopting the traditional, let's do everything from data sort of mindset. And that's really distinctive about, about your work. And, and it's also why your models are so naturally interpretable. So I just think you should play that up because in the, in the excitement about neural nets, Many people buy into all the rhetoric about how, oh, it's gotta be all from data, giant data sets. It's not true. The technology doesn't require that and you show that it doesn't. Yeah, thank you. That's actually a great point. Yeah, so that the physics, and I think I tried to say that, but you're right, that probably needs to be emphasized more that the physics is built in once, but I mean, it's built in now. So now everybody can use it as it's built in. Yeah. We have time for maybe one more question. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, I think that's a really interesting point. We're do at HA. We're doing a lot of work um, thinking about and like sustainability as well. And the question often comes up that there's just not a lot of like data in sustainability. And how can we utilize some of these new techniques that generally need big data um, and incorporating kind of the physics into those? So, anyways, I just wanted to comment that this could also is interesting in the sustainability. So also just saying this is one way, and I think. Uh, we, that was one of the earlier questions is this is one way to build in the physics. So this is really hardwired into the network. There's also models to build the physics into the loss function. 
and then constrain the loss by building the physics and the network. So you minimize the network loss and the physics loss at the same time. Um, this is just building it into the network once and we think this is a user more user friendly because it's more hidden and they don't really need too much in anything. All right, so I think we'll go ahead and wrap up there with that great discussion. And I think a problem we all face is small amounts of data and less than <laughs> we would like. Um, so I wanna thank Ellen again for a really great talk and thank the HAI team again for organizing this awesome seminar. So thank you again. And then an announcement also, um, welcome you to join us next time to hear from Guy Wang and Vanessa Parley in the third episode of the HAI podcast series. On December 13th, they'll be interviewing Srinisha Srinivasan, co-founder of Louvre and an HAI Advisory Council Vice Chair, and Isabel Levent, who's a Stanford Symbolic Systems student, co-leader of an HAI working group and off-script organizer on what we really want from AI in the creative world. Uh, we hope to see you all there for this in interactive discussion then. And thank you again for joining us today. <laughs>